Hello, and welcome to this webinar on the Mueller investigation and the prospect of impeachment, hosted by Concord Law School at Purdue University Global, the nation's first fully online law school. My name is Martin Pritikin. I'm the Dean of Concord Law School, and I'm pleased to be moderating this session today, which is being held in celebration of the American Bar Association's Law Day. Now, the theme of this year's Law Day is separation of powers, framework for freedom. Now, in an ordinary year, that might sound like a somewhat dry topic, but this is not an ordinary year, and this is not an ordinary president. Uh, in this latest installment of our Distinguished Webinar Speaker Series, we are very privileged to have with us two very distinguished speakers. Really, we couldn't ask for better experts on this topic that lies at the intersection of law and politics. Um, first, we have Susan Estrich, who is a partner at Quinn Emanuel. She's chair of their public strategy in uh, high-profile litigation practice. Uh, full disclosure, that's my former firm before I entered academia. She's also the Robert Kinkley Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of Southern California's Gold School of Law. Uh, she is a frequent legal and political analyst on Fox News Channel. And among her many accomplishments, she was the first woman president of the Harvard Law Review. She was the first woman to run a national presidential campaign and was the youngest woman tenured at Harvard Law School. So thank you very much, Susan, for joining us. Also with us is Ross... Thank you. Um, also with us is Ross Garber, who co-chairs the Government Investigations and White Collar Criminal, uh, the P White Collar Crime, excuse me, Department at Shipman and Goodwin in Washington D.C. and Hartford, Connecticut. He is also a visiting a lecturer at Tulane University School of Law, where he teaches a course on political investigations and impeachments. Um, his clients have included many federal, state, and municipal agencies and uh, officials, including well, it was three. Now it's actually four. Republican governors in impeachment proceedings and related matters. He recently was retained to represent uh, Republican Governor Eric Greitens of Missouri in connections with the allegations against him. Uh, Ross has been listed every year since 2012 uh, as the best lawyers in America for white collar criminal defense. And he also has been prominently featured as a commentator in a variety of media outlets. So thank you, Ross, as well for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> so before we get started, just a reminder to our audience members, um, if you want to type questions into the chat box, please feel free to do so. Uh, we will try, time permitting, to get to some of your questions at the end, although we certainly do have a lot of ground to cover. So I have one guest who has uh, managed a Democratic presidential campaign, another guest who's represented a number of Republican senators. So I'm wearing a purple tie, so I'm not red or blue, <laughs> I'm neutral, I'm just the moderator. Um, and I know people often have very strong views about this subject, very strong views about the president, about the special counsel investigation. Let's try and start with something not too controversial. Susan, let's start off with you. What does the Constitution actually say about impeachment? What is the authority uh, to impeach the president or anyone for that matter? Well, it's a very political answer, Marty, which is not probably how you want to start. But what the Constitution says is it's up to Congress, it's up to the House in the first instance to decide whether to return articles of impeachment, and then it's up to the Senate whether to vote to convict. And I think the bottom line is that the Founding Fathers were were pretty clever about this, as about most things, and recognized that essentially the issue is not what we three as lawyers might, you know, put our heads together and say, well, this is a high crime and misdemeanor, and this isn't a high crime and misdemeanor, and miracle of miracles, it would probably turn out to be who's a Democrat and who's a Republican, but it's really a, a political judgment in the first instance, as long as the Republicans control Congress, I don't think Donald Trump will be impeached. And if the Democrats control Congress, then it's going to become a political question for the Democrats as to whether that's a good strategy or whether, as was the case with President Clinton, they might be accused of overreaching. But, but I think the bottom line is it's politics and it's the midterm elections. Well, let me explore that a little further. So <clears throat> the actual substantive standard in the Constitution uh, for what could be grounds for impeachment is treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. So Ross, uh, we, we think we know what treason or bribery means, but high crimes and misdemeanors, is there any historical precedent or any sort of agreed upon understanding as to what that phrase means or should mean? And if not, are there any sort of prevailing views about what it's supposed to mean? So a couple of things. Susan, Susan's right. Is it is primarily a, a political decision, a political standard, but not exclusively. I mean, the, 
the Constitution does say something about standard in the process, right? And it says treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, you know, could a president or somebody else be impeached for, I don't know, being a bad guy, for parking tickets, for you know, something like that? The answer is almost certainly not. Um, and so the, the language of the Constitution actually does mean something. Uh, so treason, we, I think we generally understand what that means, although the definition in the Constitution was, was, uh, was a little bit different at the time. But essentially it's being beholden to a foreign power and doing things on a foreign power's behalf. Bribery, we sort of understand what that is generally. It's doing something that you shouldn't be doing uh, on, in exchange for uh, something paid by another person. So not doing what you're supposed to be doing officially and instead doing something at the behest of uh, somebody else for improper reasons. We sort of get what that means. And other high crimes and misdemeanors, there, you know, we sort of know from the Founding Fathers that those are, you know, political crimes, things that go to the heart of, uh, of the process, go to the heart of injury to the government. And so, you know, those terms aren't untethered from, from those sorts of legal concepts. Historically, I mean, we've never removed a president. Uh, so at least in, in the presidential context, uh, it's, uh, it is hard to, uh, to define it further than that. There have been uh, two impeachments of presidents in the past, uh, and, and in those cases, we can sort of look at, at what those impeachments were about, but the bottom line is we haven't removed a president. Well, but Ross, wait one sec. You know, where were you when I needed you in, uh, <laughs> in, in the late 90s? And I was standing there saying, you know, what is, is in a deposition about a guy's sex life who happens to be president, but, you know, how many guys have ever lied about their sex lives in a deposition? I, I wouldn't want to impeach them all from high office, but, you know, people like me were standing there on a high horse saying, that's not an impeachable offense. And a lot of your friends were standing there saying, oh, yes, it is. It's lying under oath. Very serious. Unless their guy does it. Well, yeah, maybe and maybe not. I mean, it I think there probably were some Republicans at the time, even, uh, who, who had a different view. And uh, certainly in hindsight, we've heard Republicans, uh, you know, raise questions about whether that even met the standard. But, but the bottom line is the president was not, uh, he was not convicted. He wasn't removed from office. And so it turns out that, you know, maybe lying under oath, maybe, uh, isn't enough to remove somebody from office. As long as your party controls the Senate, you know? <laughs> Maybe. Well, so w why doesn't high crimes and misdemeanors, I mean, misdemeanors, usually we think of the alternative to misdemeanors of felony, right? Why don't we just say high crime means felony and misdemeanor means misdemeanor, and so any indictable offense would be grounds for impeachment. Isn't that a reasonable interpretation of what that means? Uh, you want to take it, Susan, or you want me to? Well, I mean, you know, according to whom? You know, I mean, ultimately, it's according to voters, according to members of Congress. If you ask me, can somebody take it to the Supreme Court and say, excuse us, but yes, there were enough members of Congress to, to return the articles of impeachment and enough senators to, to vote to convict. But we'd like to take it to the United States Supreme Court for an appeal as to whether it constitutes a high crime or misdemeanor. You know, you know, that's when you start asking, you know, who's going to enforce that Supreme Court decision if it comes out the wrong way? And the answer is it's not going to come out the wrong way because the Supreme Court wouldn't go near that with a 10 foot pole. I mean, that is the essence of a decision that's, you know, conferred on the two houses. And you can argue that that's why the, the founders were smart using this vague and general term like, well, it's either bribery, treason or whatever else you think it might be above parking tickets. Do yeah. you agree with that, Ross? And well, parking well, tickets well, if you think it's parking tickets. Well, although, although one thing we do know from that phrase is it was sort of imported from England where, where the notion of high crimes and misdemeanors meant crimes against the crown. It wasn't sort of just any crime at all. It was a high crime and misdemeanor, a crime against the crown. So it's, a, it's something that's really bad that injures the government, it sort of goes to the heart of, of governing. So it, it, 
you know, I would argue it can't be something like parking tickets. It probably can't be something, uh, you know, unless it is so egregious uh, that it goes to the heart of governing if it were committed before the president took office. I mean, I, I, I think I, I think it is it, it winds up being fact dependent. And, and, and you know, as Susan's point out, not not uh, uh, not without consideration of, of politics, certainly. Uh, but the process winds up being so difficult, so onerous, so disruptive, so expensive that uh, it, so far it hasn't happened and is unlikely to happen that a president would be impeached and removed for something unless it were incredibly serious. Well, so let me follow up on something Susan said, because she said if someone were to take an impeachment issue to the Supreme Court, they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Do you agree with that? I mean, when we, when we talk about impeachments, we're generally talking about Congress and the executive, but this is a discussion about separation of powers. There is a third branch, the judiciary. Um, what, would the court get involved in an impeachment issue? Have they ever? Uh, you, you want me to take that? or you Sure, want to yeah. Sure. Okay, so... Uh, so the answer is it is largely a political process, uh, and uh, these issues are almost never litigated. Uh, they, there was a, an occasion uh, where a judge challenged uh, his impeachment by arguing that the Senate uh, procedure was improper. Uh, and in that case, the Supreme Court said uh, exactly what, what Susan has said. The Supreme Court said, this is a political question. Essentially, we don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> but, but there is a concurring opinion in that case involving Judge Nixon uh, where two justices said, well, you know what? We agree with the result, but maybe there could be a circumstance in which the courts would look at impeachment issues. And, and at least on the state level, uh, I've had two courts uh, take jurisdiction over impeachment issues and essentially distinguish uh, the Nixon case. Really? So I, yeah. So, so uh, the notion of courts not being involved under any circumstances uh, in impeachment, I'm not sure I'd, I'd go that far. I think there are circumstances where, uh, where courts might get involved in impeachments. And, and, and after all, why not? It's a, it, 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 the courts are the third branch of government. They're the ones who usually say what the Constitution means. In theory, sure. But, I mean, in practice, let's look at this. I mean, Richard Nixon, who arguably committed the most egregious instances of you know, infractions against the government and abuse of power, he was not formally impeached and convicted because when the political tides turned and it became clear that that was the handwriting that was on the wall, he left. Um, I think in Bill Clinton's case, you saw the utter politicization of the impeachment process. And one of the interesting things is going to be to see how many people like me, you've got tape of saying, you know, impeachment for private consensual this and that. It's not like he obstructed justice in a public way or anything. Um, we'll try anything. But, you know, the truth of the matter is it was totally politicized at the time. And virtually everybody who had a Democratic hat found a way to defend President Clinton. And virtually everybody who had a Republican hat found a way to vote for impeachment, including a number of members of Congress who themselves were, were arguably doing exactly, you know, the underlying, you know, inappropriate sexual relationships that, you know, Bill Clinton was supposedly having. I guess he did have. So, so, so I think part of the problem is that when we talk about misconduct, particularly of a president, unless it's so egregious that you've got, you know, folks really crossing partisan lines, we are talking about a political issue, and it'll ultimately be resolved politically, I think, in the case of this president. We'll see what happens in the midterm election, and then we'll see what happens in two years from now in terms of his own re-election. And I guess I think that's probably the way it should be, because I think for all our efforts at principle, it, it really does come down to, I think Donald Trump should be impeached, well, if that's the only way to get rid of him, I'd probably favor any way to get rid of him, but I don't pretend to have principle on my side. You know. Well, Let's I appreciate that. Mueller, then it that. would be a different matter. <laughs> um, although, is it the issue that 
the process has become more politicized? I know a lot of people talk about that. Or has it always been the case? I mean, the original presidential impeachment was Andrew Johnson, right, from uh, 1860. Was. I mean, wasn't that all politics? Yeah, so that, that one was all politics. And w- yeah. one can actually argue that the partisanship in the Clinton impeachment was potentially even a benefit because there, the par- because the, 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 the Republicans and the Democrats battled it out in Congress. They battled it out in the House. They, had, they battled it out in, uh, in the Senate. And so there, there was rigorous debate about lots and lots and lots of issues. It wasn't uh, sort of the, the legislative branch versus the executive branch. It was, in essence, the Republicans versus the Democrats. Uh, what, again, you know, sort of back to the, the issue of potentially courts getting involved, one could imagine a scenario where it is Congress versus the president. Uh, and, and, you know, we haven't had very many impeachments, so it's hard to say, you know, what a situation would look like. Um, but, you know, imagine a, a special counsel report that gets dropped on Congress and, uh, and Congress feels like it needs to do something to protect itself politically. The Republicans maybe decide they need to do something to protect themselves politically. And you do have sort of a legislative branch versus executive branch issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, it, again, it, it, it's not beyond the ken that there could be uh, a place for the courts in that kind of uh, a setting. They can give the tapes. They can order the release of the tapes, right? <laughs> Well, um, maybe, which, which poses another issue is, you know, again, normally these issues are worked out between, you know, Congress and, and the president. Uh, that's normally how it works. Uh, you know, so far, I think no Congress has ever subpoenaed a president to testify uh, no. before, before Congress. So We're going to get that, trust me. Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll, we'll hold that, that concept. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let me just clarify something, because I think there might be some confusion amongst some members of the audience in terms of ter- terminology. You mentioned that Nixon wasn't impeached. You also mentioned that no president has been removed. But I think a lot of people in the popular perception have the idea that Nixon was impeached, and that meant he got kicked out of office. So what, is it, what does impeachment actually mean? What, is, what procedurally does that step involve? Well, well, you have to have first the, I mean, Clinton was technically impeached. He just wasn't convicted. It's, you know, Ross can give you the details, but it's the House returns the articles of impeachment and the Senate then sits in judgment and decides whether to vote for conviction or not. Um, just by coincidence, as I recall, the House was controlled by Republicans when President Clinton was impeached, but the Democratic Senate chose not to convict. Um, I think the one point I would make, Marty, just to go back to something Ross said, lest I be seen as the high priestess of politics here, is that if you see something, if we were to see something like the Saturday Night Massacre, I was a kid then, but I remember my father had been a sort of Massachusetts Republican, which is to say a rhino, which is to say Republican in name only, but it, it, it was a Republican in Massachusetts anyway. And the night, that Saturday night when Richard Nixon, you know, ordered the attorney general Elliot Richardson to fire Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor, and then the attorney general refused to do so when he stepped down, and the deputy attorney general refused to step do so when he stepped down, and then ultimately um, Archibald Cox was fired, um, and Nixon lost his presidency that night. I think should Donald Trump make the mistake, I mean the fatal mistake, everyone's told him that, still he could do it, of deciding to fire Robert Mueller. I think, the, you know, the, the only thing he has to fear is himself here. We can leave out the fear itself and just say himself. If he leaves Mueller to do his own work, he probably won't find obstruction in any indictable way. But if the president does indeed try to obstruct that inquiry, I think it'll end his presidency. And you'll see, as Ross says, you'll see the the... Congress uniting and the presidency will become untenable. I don't think you'll have to go to the courts because I think when that happens, the presidency becomes untenable and the, the helicopter has to la- land on the lawn somehow. You're saying, Susan, you're saying even a Republican 
House might take action. Of course. I mean, I think I think enough Republican leaders would defect in that circumstance, both in the Senate and the House, to make the president's situation untenable. Do you agree with that, Ross? Well, when when you say untenable, as you know, impeachment is a is a long and and disruptive process. Well, I know, but we've been through it. It's really a horrible process. But by untenable, I mean if you've got a majority in both houses, you know, committed to to doing you in and you begin the endless process of hearings in this 24-hour news cycle, it's going to take less time, not more time for 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 that to become untenable, I think. Yeah, the, all of that may be true, but it may also point up the issue that I was sort of flagging which was, which is sort of this, uh, the question of executive prerogative and almost sort of an executive versus legislative uh, branch controversy. Uh, you know, Susan identified one potential issue is the president making a decision regarding uh, the Department of Justice that he oversees. Uh, if that were to happen, I don't know that it would trigger impeachment. In, in, I think it probably would trigger, I think it certainly would trigger a, a, a very uh, robust discussion of executive powers. A very robust discussion. I, I got a job for you on Pennsylvania <laughs> Ave. You know, I mean, he needs you. I'm telling I mean, you, you are better at this, Ross, than well, anybody he's got on his team. I, I appreciate you saying that. No, but, I'm not sure you will. I mean, I know it's not but I mean, really, so the, you know, the, the question is, you know, would a Republican Congress, uh, you know, impeach a president and, and potentially remove a president for making that kind of decision, for saying, hey, look, I'm the president, I oversee the executive branch of government, and here's what I think my Department of Justice should look at and what I think it should prioritize. I, I think maybe not, but it would be an interesting discussion. Well, let me jump in here because I want to try and sort of ground our discussion about the special counsel, right? That's part of the topic of this webinar. So the Constitution talks about the president, talks about the vice president, doesn't talk about special counsel. So where does even this notion about special counsel come from? Politics, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's an invention of our time. And that's why Ross is both technically correct and politically, I would argue it might not matter. That is to say, technically, of course, he's right. The special counsel is not a, um, a th- fourth branch of government. It's, you know, a creation of the Justice Department here appointed by the, the attorney general. And, well, in this case, you, you know, you've got the special counsel reporting, I guess, to the deputy attorney general because of the recusal issues. But technically, he works for the president. In practice, however, we've come to think of these special counsels as entirely independent operators, whether or not they're appointed in accordance with a congressional statute or not. Um, When the Justice Department decides to appoint a special counsel, in our minds, we think of them as independent counsels who can't be removed except by act of God, or at least, you know, both houses of Congress. And so I think as a practical matter, uh, President Trump is, is stuck with Robert Mueller, even though as a technical matter, Ross is right. He's got a right to fire anybody who works for him, and that includes people who work for him in the Justice Department. It's just dicey when you do see Mr. Comey, for example. Yeah, and, and, and again, who knows how it's going to play out. But it, it, to me, it's sort of like one of those issues where, like, you know, sometimes in families, there are those issues that you just don't talk about. You pretend everything is okay. Everything's good with your brothers and your sisters and your aunts and your uncles, all that. And there are issues you just don't talk about. Sort of the relationship between the president and the Department of Justice, for me, is sort of one of those issues. I mean, remember, <laughs> back during the Kennedy administration, uh, the, the president appointed his brother to be the attorney general. He was smart. General. Right. So, so there... Th- it's tough to argue even it, – it, it, it's impossible to argue that in that setting you had an independent <laughs> Department of Justice, right? So you pointed out his brother. Then fast, you know, fast forward just a tiny bit to the Nixon administration, and there people were shocked, shocked that the president was interfering, was affecting at all what the Department of Justice was doing. 
And so out of that grew this notion uh, that the Department of Justice and the FBI should be independent of the president. And in fact, Congress passed an independent council law um, where there was this sort of you know, elaborate setup where an independent council was named you know, separate from the Department of Justice to operate independently. And, and, and Susan can, you know, probably talk with more knowledge about how that all worked out. Really great. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is it was a disaster. Everybody, everybody it was awful. would probably had these out of control folks. I mean, it was like combine the worst of all independent investigations in, 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 and then put it on television. I mean, just a nightmare. Yeah. Terrible. It was a terrible process. Right. And, well, and, and so the notion of having a, a, a prosecutor sort of independent of the executive branch, that doesn't work. And so what we've devolved to today, the, the independent counsel law was not renewed. Congress realized, everybody realized that was, it, was, it was a nightmare. So it was not renewed. That went bye-bye. And so now we've got these regulations mm. in the Department of Justice to create something that looks sort of kind of almost maybe like an independent counsel. We call it a special counsel. But not exactly. But not exactly. Right. <laughs> and, and, and that is what, what Bob Mueller is. And, 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 and yeah, he sort of acts independently, sort of, uh, although, <laughs> although the, the Deputy Attorney General has assured us that he is not an unguided missile. And I assume that there are lots of communications up the chain and down the chain between the special counsel and the Deputy Attorney General. But there is a question about how independent the the special counsel is and and should be. You know, we have evolved, maybe not evolved, we've grown into this place where uh, the uh, the Department of Justice and the FBI see Jim Comey, really do think they are a fourth branch of government. Uh, and, you know, and, and Susan's right, if something, it, if the president today were to exercise his executive authority, which is given to him under the Constitution and by the voters, and by the Electoral College, there would be a kerfuffle um, about that, but it might actually lead to a productive discussion about the role of the Department of Justice and the FBI and law enforcement and its relationship to the, uh, the president. Well, so is it purely a political issue? I mean, I've heard people make the claim that the president doesn't have the legal authority to fire Bob Mueller. Is, is there any substance to that argument? Depends who you're asking. I mean, I'm sure Democrats would go to court and say the courts should nullify this firing. Um, but I think the reality is that we don't have an independent counsel law and that, you know, I mean, what's to stop him from firing a special counsel any more than he'd he'd fire anybody else. Now you could argue it would violate Department of Justice regulations, but again, according to whom, right? I mean, would the Attorney General carry out the instruction? Would the Deputy Attorney General carry it out? At what point do you have to go down the chain to get somebody who will carry it out? And then, you know, the reality is you'd have a revolt among Republicans in the Senate. I can promise you of that. Now, it might not be all of them, but it would be a sufficient number where you've got, what, a two-vote majority right now with the vice president sitting there, so you lose your Senate. So, I mean, the reality is I don't think Donald Trump has the political clout right now to get rid of Mueller. I think if he did, he would have done it, frankly, because he can't stand the guy, and it's driving him completely crazy. And, you know, if you believe half of what he tweets... He would love to be rid of this guy. And instead, you've got Mueller's office apparently leaking the questions that they want to ask to Trump. I mean, you've got to understand that must be driving him completely crazy. So, I mean, I think the president is stuck with Mueller, not as a matter of law, but as a matter of fact. And I don't think anything about that is going to change for him in the near future. So Mueller can act as independent as he wants, because right now nobody can stop him. Yeah, well, uh, although we, we used to think we knew about how politics worked and about how, uh, you know, Donald Trump worked until until this election. So I'm not sure we actually know anymore what, you know, what works and what doesn't work. Um, it, it certainly would be politically dicey 
for the president to to, to fire uh, uh, Bob Mueller or to cause his termination. Um, whether he could survive it or not, I, you know, I, I'm not sure he couldn't survive it. Uh, and, and 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 yes, clearly, uh, uh, Bob Mueller's activities are are driving the president crazy. Um, and 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 look, I mean, to 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 credit the president on this kind of stuff. Can you imagine if it is not true uh, that there was any sort of collusion with Russia? Uh, you know, imagine if, if you were sitting in that chair and somebody were investigating you for a year for something that you know did not happen. It just didn't yeah. happen. You didn't do it. Um, imagine that. And imagine if it were so disruptive to your life, your job, what you're trying to do, your, all of that. Uh, you'd be looking for, for a way to address that situation, too. Well, Ross, I would feel much worse for him if it weren't his campaign chairman who was over there and his son who was having these meetings. And, you know, what Donald Trump knew and when he knew it, we obviously don't know. Yeah. But, you know, you can't, you know, feel too badly for a guy who surrounded himself at best with uh, some faithless fiduciaries there who who at best let him down quite royally and at worst, I guess we're doing his bidding. Well, an analogy I think of is sort of in the employment law context, right? Where let's say an employee uh, claims that an employer has been discriminating against them and so uh, they fire them, right? Saying you're making baseless claims. And then they may not have been discriminating against them but yet the firing itself is deemed retaliatory. So it's not the underlying conduct, it's the response to the conduct, right? So it, it is possible that there was absolutely no collusion. Trump knows it, if that's what happened, right? But yet it could be that his response to the investigation itself might get him in hot water. I mean, that oh. might actually be the problem. Oh, he certainly can't, you know, I mean... Ross is being so diplomatic, and really, he's got to get you on Fox News. I mean, I'm going to send the tape right in to my old friends, um, because you're doing much better than all the screamers do for him. I mean, you know, a productive discussion, a kerfuffle. I mean, these are nice words for, you know, Christmas in August for the Democratic caucus. I mean, you know, it would not be good for the country. Let's put it this way. You know, this is one where you have to put your two hats on. Would it be good for the country? No, it would be a constitutional crisis. And people like Ross and I would be fully employed going on television, talking about, you know, the constitutional challenges. But at the end of the day, it would be terrible for the Republican Party politically, and it would be terrific for the Democratic Party politically if the president were to, you know, turn around and fire Bob Mueller and, as you say, Marty, create an impeachable issue where the truth is, as is mostly the case in these circumstances, it's not the underlying problem. It's the cover up that always gets people in trouble. Well, let me shift the focus for a second, because some have claimed that it's actually the Mueller investigation that's been behaving inappropriately um, in terms of some of the FBI agents involved in investigation, tweeting anti-Trump, uh, or not tweeting, but texting. Um, is there plausible grounds to end the Mueller investigation other than the fact that politically the president might not like it? Nobody uh, wants to touch this one, huh? <laughs> I say no. See if process. Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah. let's see if we're in parts here. Yeah, that was pretty good with both of us waiting each other out on that one. <laughs> but so the the answer the answer is we actually don't know. Uh, you know, uh, unless you're involved in the investigation, you really do have sort of a limited view in, into what's going on. Uh, you know, there are people living it every day. The president's living it every day. His lawyers are living it every day. Uh, the Mueller team is living it every day. And so the answer is, we actually don't know. Uh, you know, Susan suggested that, uh, that the Mueller team may have leaked the questions they intend to ask the president. Shocking. It, it, well, it, if that's the case, actually, yeah, I, I think that would be incredibly inappropriate if that's... Well, of course it would happened. be. Right. And so, so look, maybe there... Although there have been claims in the media that it was actually someone on Trump's team yeah, that so we don't questions. Uh, that, that's my point. Well, that's right. That's, that's the other side yeah. of it. I that's my point. Nice. It, is is we don't know. You know, one of the interesting things I, I think that we're going to see soon is, you know, what is the product of, of this Mueller investigation? 
you know, certainly there have been indictments already, uh, but he's continuing to investigate. Uh, is he planning on charging other people? Probably. You know, but what's he going to do with, with the president? Uh, you know, the Department well, the president of Justice cannot be charged with any crimes while he's in office. And I'm not saying I, I'm you know, making a conclusion I think he has. But even if there was evidence that he had, procedurally, that couldn't happen while he's in office, right? So that's what the Department of Justice has said. Uh, you know, Ken Starr, uh, uh, Susan's old nemesis, said, well, you know a what? friend later. Well, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it has said, well, actually, and, and Ken Starr, when he, when he was the independent counsel, said, actually, uh, I don't agree with the Department of Justice's conclusion that a president can't be charged while in office. I think a president can be, but, but in that case, shouldn't. So you know, let's assume because I think it's probably true, that a president can't be charged in office. Well, so then what is Bob Mueller up to? Uh, right. Maybe he's investigating other people, but as to the president, what's he up to? Because uh, the independent counsel law provided that if uh, the independent counsel found credible uh, facts uh, that might constitute impeachable offenses, well then... The independent counsel was supposed to transmit a report of that to Congress. Right. The special counsel, Bob Mueller, he has uh, – that, that is not part of his charge. That's not in the regulations. And so, uh, so there's no provision for Bob Mueller to make any sort of report like that to Congress. So if there's no provision for, for a report to Congress and there's no ability to charge the president with crimes – you know, what is the end game here for Bob Mueller? What's he up to? And any thoughts on that? Oh, he, what's he up to? He's up to investigating all the people around the president who might be chargeable with crimes. And he will be up to responding to Congress if called upon by Congress to respond and give them whatever findings through the appropriate channels of the Justice Department and the Justice Department in turn <laughs> testifying before Congress. I mean, as you know, Russ, this will play out. It doesn't play out in an indictment. I think Marty and, and you are probably right about that. I don't think it plays out in an indictment in a conventional sense, but I think it plays out in reports to Congress, whether formal or informal. And I think it plays out in media investigations, whether formal or informal. I have no way of knowing who's doing the leaking. I only know that in my experience, you tell me about yours, prosecutor's leak. It's a really shocking thing that happens sometimes. <laughs> FBI agents have even been known to leak in my experience. I know Ross is looking more and more shocked as he sits there on his side of the camera. But, I mean, there's leaking that goes on all over the place. And there's amazing reporting that also goes on. And I've never seen an administration that leaks, according to all my friends, like this one. I mean, they leak in real time, like sieves. I mean, they leak from the very top in tweets. So, you know, I mean, the president could well be the one telling us what the questions are for the way this administration operates. But I don't think any of this is going to go on in, in, in in pure secret. I think once indictments are returned, this investigation will reach a certain point where either the president will feel like he has to give an interview or he'll feel like he's going to the legal risk is, is high enough that he's willing to pay the political price of not giving the interview. Or he's got other Clearly. things to worry about. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> Let me ask about that question then, like right? depositions? I don't know. So uh, Rudy Giuliani, there's been talk of him getting involved to try and negotiate the terms of an interview with Mueller's team. Um, does the president have the authority to refuse to sit for an interview? Is there law on that point? So the answer is yes. Uh, nobody, nobody has to actually sit for an interview with the government. Right. Uh, but if I mean, you sit, if you sit for an interview, you got to tell the truth, and the president right. has, and, and, and then you get the trouble if you don't. Yeah. So, so well, the president has, has, the, has. Does he have the authority to subpoena him? And could Trump resist the subpoena? So, 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 in terms of a voluntary interview, the president's just like everybody else. He has the right, right. to not sit for a voluntary right. interview. Now. The special counsel could subpoena the president to testify before the grand jury. And in, you know, back during the Starr independent counsel investigation of Bill Clinton, Ken Starr actually did issue a grand jury subpoena to right. the president. And, and, and is that enforceable? 
nobody really knows. Uh, in, in that situation, the president uh, did not litigate the issue, uh, but worked out sort of a special deal with the, uh, with the independent counsel there. Where, Such a deal. <laughs> well, actually, it's a pretty good deal. When my clients <laughs> testify before the grand jury, they have to actually go over to the courthouse. I know. They have I to know. walk in the room. But they're and, not president. And, you know? and, no, that's my point. Yeah. And, they have, to, and yeah. they have to sit there, and I don't get to go into the room with them. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, back during uh, Clinton, uh, the president, you know, Susan remembers, you know, got to testify, you know, from the White House got to do it flanked by lawyers. I think there were other accommodations. You know, would the, so the, the first question is, would Bob Mueller subpoena the president to testify? Who knows? Would that subpoena be enforceable? Who knows? And then would the president and his lawyers work out some sort of deal with, uh, with Bob Mueller? Who knows? Now, you know, it, 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 in a way, uh, it surprises me that we're still talking about it interview with uh, with Bob Mueller and the president. I can't imagine any scenario in which that actually makes any sense at all. Um, Why? Well, because uh, the, the, the subject matter uh, that it appears the special counsel is looking at is incredibly broad. The president has spent a career as a business guy, as a salesman, as a TV personality, as a deal maker. He's, he's not somebody like you or me or Susan who's used to watching his, his words and being incredibly precise with his language. Um, we've seen that uh, the presidents and others have been uh, impeached for, uh, for lying in that kind of setting. And so it's incredibly dangerous for the president to, to just sit for an interview. Uh, you know, the other thing about an interview is uh, it is not confidential. Uh, you know, the, if you testify before the grand jury, grand jury secrecy rules apply, you know, especially given, you know, this setting where it's not an independent counsel investigation. An interview is not like that. You might have a whole bunch of prosecutors and FBI agents sitting around the table taking notes. And, you know, I, I, I in a way, I'd be surprised if, you know, 30 minutes went by after the end of that kind of interview that, it, uh, that, that the results weren't leaked. And so I, I don't see any uh, uh, great scenario under which the president would submit to that kind of interview as a practical or, or a legal matter. Now, you know, if he were subpoenaed, you know, then it, to testify before the grand jury, then, you know, he'd have to evaluate whether to take part uh, in that kind of uh, uh, testimony and, 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 and under what conditions. The president has been his own worst enemy about this, okay? Ross is actually completely right. There was no criminal defense attorney in practice for more than 12 cents an hour who would ever say to an individual in the situation of the president, okay, other than the fact that he's president, here's a really good idea. Why don't you voluntarily submit to an interview with these people who are trying to make their chops, okay, by catching you on something? And they'd like to interview you about anything you've ever done in the past nah, 40 or 50 years. But, but don't worry, we'll have a day or two to get ready. And, you know, there's going to be 20 of them sitting in the room. And don't worry about a thing, because if you say anything wrong, it's a felony. On the other hand, if you say anything bad, they can talk about it. So let's agree to that, because doesn't that sound like a hell of a deal? What's the upside? Zero. What's the downside? 20 years, you know? Depends how many false statements they catch you on. To and maybe impeachment. federal person in the yeah. room, a federal official in the room. So it's nuts, except for the fact that the president, rather than, you know, listening to lawyer number one, John Dowd, who said you shouldn't do this interview and clearly was willing to go out front as saying my best advice as an attorney is not to do this. And why should the president manage to not be different from anybody else? I'm just giving them the same <laughs> advice I give anyone else. Let the lawyer take the heat. No.
The lawyer ends up leaving because the dance is that the president doesn't want to take his advice because, you know, he's a reality TV star. So why shouldn't he give an interview to 19 federal prosecutors? Sure, it's just like being on the Oprah show. No. And, you know, he's really elongated this thing. And well, and... and- out and created a dance and put the pressure on himself to now give this interview that no lawyer in her right mind would suggest. I, I still think it's not going to happen. Now, maybe the president thinks, well, you know, if it, real, if it goes worse than I think, maybe I can just pardon myself and I still serve right. in the Senate. <laughs> I'll, I'll get Pence to do it and then we'll switch jobs and then I'll take it back. Right. No. <laughs> well, let me, um, let me ask some questions about some of the, the substantive allegations, some of the things that might constitute potentially impeachable defenses or indictable defenses uh, if the evidence bears out. Susan, this question is particularly for you because I haven't talked to a lot of people who've actually personally been involved in running presidential campaigns. So here's a question I have, right? The meeting that Donald Trump Jr. had with the Russian lawyer Vasilinskaya, right, which originally it was claimed it had nothing to do with dirt on Hillary. Then it came out that maybe it did. Originally she said she didn't have any affiliation with the Russian government. Then it came out maybe she did, right? So Obviously, Trump's political opponents jumped on this and said, aha, here's your evidence number one of collusion, right? And the response back was, there's no evidence. And you know what? This is just politics as usual. So a lot of people have talked about, well, what would a typical response be? So I want to know from someone who's been involved in a political campaign, if a foreign national came to you and said they might have uh, opposition intel on your political opponents, what would a typical reaction be to the extent there is a typical reaction? How would you have responded? I, I would have called Madeleine Albright and reported it to the authorities. Really? Who, yeah, of course. I mean, if a foreign national, particularly a foreign national of a, a country who was, you know, any foreign national. I mean, look, you can get in trouble if it's an ally. We, we've seen that. No, I, I mean, it, it's one thing if a lobbyist for the ACL, for the AFL-CIO or the ACLU or anybody like that gets in touch with you and you have a conversation. But no, if it's a foreign national, I wouldn't go near that with a 10-foot pole. I get in touch with authorities and let them know and not have anything to do with it. So let me follow up and ask. So if it were the case that President Trump knew at the time and sanctioned the meeting, is that something that would be uh, either impeachable or an indictable offense? I think it's such a horrendous error of judgment that it calls into question exactly what these folks were doing. I mean, I have to believe that the president, I mean, I hope the president did not know about such a meeting or its terms. I, I, when, when the story came out and Donald Trump Jr. said, hey, am I the first guy in politics who's ever taken a meeting like this about an opponent? I have to tell you, I was really offended because I thought, yeah, you know, you are, you are the first guy in politics that I've ever met who goes and meets with foreign nationals, Russian nationals, to, to try to trade what? for information about your opponent. I've never heard of anybody, Republican or Democrat, who's ever done that. And I don't think any of the people I know in politics would do that. Ross, thoughts on this you want to add? Yeah, so, so yes, yeah. Susan wouldn't have taken the meeting. I certainly hope I wouldn't have taken the meeting. And I certainly hope I would have advised, uh, if anybody asked me, to not take that kind of meeting. Having said that, uh, these folks uh, were, for the most part, not career uh, political operatives. Uh, Donald Trump Jr. was certainly not a, a career political operative. And, and it sounds like what happened was somebody came to him and said, hey, look, I've got information, true information, accurate information uh, about Hillary Clinton uh, that might be significant. Uh, and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll listen to it. Now, it doesn't sound like it went any place. He sat there. He listened. There wasn't any there there. And that was and that was it. And 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 so, you know, at this point, it does sound like, you know, this has been politicized. Certainly the you know, the Hillary Clinton supporters are are upset about that. But but I think let's find out whether there is any anything there, uh, whether there was any collusion at all, um, because it doesn't sound like that meeting uh, constituted any collusion. Either he's an idiot. Okay. Either this guy is a certifiable 
idiot, okay? And, and when these Russians come to him, okay, who does he think he's going to meet with? Who is he having a meeting with in Trump Tower? People from the street? People who've just got him from the phone directory? I mean, this is all... You don't get a meeting with, with Donald Trump's son if you're, you know, just calling off the phone directory. I mean, either this kid is dumber than a doorknob, okay, or he is so damn careless that his father shouldn't let him near anything or he checked with daddy at the end of the day. Now, I don't think we'll ever know which of those three it is. But I think it's pretty darn troubling. I don't think Chelsea Clinton would have made this mistake. I don't think George W. Bush made, would have made this mistake when his father was president or was running for president. I think it is a measure of the carelessness, okay, of these folks around power and with the instruments of power that is really so dangerous at the end of the day. I right, really do. Right, but I, I want to be... I want to make sure we're careful because, I mean, obviously being politically unsophisticated is not a crime. And, and, and even the notion of carelessness, you know, we heard that term thrown around with respect to Hillary Clinton. And, and I'm, I'm in the same... The Russians? Hold on, I'm, I'm in the same place there. You know, it, you know, carelessness is not a crime. So I think let's see what happens. Let's see what the result is again. I, I think, you know, none of the three of us would have taken the meeting or sanctioned the meeting or anything like that. But let's see if, if there was any sort of crime. That was but shouldn't made. he be as careful as we are? And if he's not as careful as we are, then he shouldn't be meeting on be taking meetings on behalf of the future president of the United States. I mean, it's really, you know, these, he either should rein in these folks or they ought to do what they're supposed to do and report what they've done to the to the authorities. I just think the sloppiness, okay, at the very least it's sloppiness about ethics and it, it ought to be troubling because I've never seen an administration that's quite this sloppy. Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm so careful I will never be the CEO or acting CEO of a billion dollar you know, yeah, multinational well, company. So, neither will well, I because of all the things, silly <laughs> things I say on television. Yeah. Well, we don't have much time left, and there's obviously so much to cover. So I want to ask a few more pointed questions. So uh, the topic of alleged obstruction of justice could itself take a full hour, right? But, I mean, there's a few different key things that we've seen from the list of leaked questions, if we didn't already know, that the, where, where, where Mueller's looking to go in terms of the firing of James Comey, right, floating the idea of pardoning Flynn once he heard Flynn was, was pleading guilty and was going to cooperate, do either you think, taking the sum totality of the evidence we've heard about just in the media, does it constitute obstruction of justice or not? Susan, I'll give you this one. You know, it depends who's prosecuting. You know, I used to joke when I taught criminal law for years and years that a good prosecutor could get an indictment of a ham sandwich, right? And, and, and not only an indictment, but maybe a conviction. All right. I mean, the, the idea of what's an indictable offense. Sure, it's an indictable offense if, if somebody wants to indict it. Is it a convictable offense? I don't know. Tell me who's on the jury. Maybe they would. Um, is it the kind of uh, wrongdoing that's likely to result in a congressional revolt? Well, it hasn't yet. And I don't think it's costing Trump his base. Um, so it, unless you see a dramatic turn in the midterms, do I think this is going to end the Trump presidency? No. No, I, I, I just don't see it yet. Now, now, could more come out? Could something else come out? Could, you know, the winds change? Maybe. But, you know, it, it, if everything we had seen to date was enough, it would be enough. And it, it hasn't been enough. Ross? And, look, and, and there might be more that comes out. Uh, you know, there, it, it goes back to almost where we started, though, which is, you know, can a president be accused of impeached, removed for this notion of obstruction of justice for directing the activities of the Justice Department that he was elected by the American people to oversee? And, and I think that I think that is probably a bridge too far. I think that's a that is a stretch. Are you um, saying there's no limits to what he could do? I mean, you know, uh, again, I'm not saying this is the case, but I mean, if it was the case that he knew that Mueller or whoever 
was directly going after him, had evidence of a crime, and directed his FBI director, let's say, to or DOJ director to destroy evidence. You're saying a president could do that because that's he's overseeing the activities of an executive branch agent? Well, so, you know, are there scenarios where that wouldn't be okay? Sure, there are scenarios where that wouldn't be okay. The president was taking bribes, uh, and, and in exchange for, you know, for bribes was interfering with the Department of Justice. That's obviously not okay. You know, if the president were somehow, uh, you know, doing that at the behest of some foreign power, that's obviously, obviously not okay. But if a president is doing that, uh, if he's supervising his Department of Justice and he's doing it because he thinks it's in the best interest of the American people that, uh, that something happened or not happen, uh, I think that'd be a, a, a tough uh, or impossible case to prosecute, even if you could prosecute a president, and a, and a tough or impossible uh, uh, basis for impeachment and removal. All right, so as a law professor, I have to push my hypothetical, right? So you've, you've sort of spun off a couple of different variations. What if it was the case that he directed a DOJ official to destroy evidence because he thought that evidence would hurt his own political or criminal prospects? Could he do that within his discretion as the head of the executive branch? Ross wouldn't defend him if he did, and therefore he couldn't get away with it. How's that for now? <laughs> And I, and I think I think still a lot depends on 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 why he would have a DOJ official, you know, do that. It'd be harder, as Susan has alluded to, it'd be much harder to argue that uh, that that a, someone would have a DOJ official destroy information, destroy documents, uh, because that was in the best interest of the American people. Now, again, would it be indictable? Probably not. Uh, could it be a, uh, a basis for impeachment or removal? Maybe. Let me ask one more question. So uh, there's been a lot of news lately, obviously, about Michael Cohn, right? The Stormy Daniels payment. Um, his offices were raided. Documents, computers were seized. It was uh, reported that uh, Mueller's people were looking for evidence relating to the Access Hollywood tapes. Um, I think a lot of people have this question. What does that have to do with the Mueller investigation or Russian collusion or obstruction of justice? What does that have to do with anything, and why is that getting reported on so much? I think that's a Southern District of New York investigation. I mean, the one thing I do know on that is that, um, my goodness, we've replaced Ross with a picture of himself. I'm <laughs> I think my he's having a problems, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I that's not a good one. Sort of, yeah. No, I, I think you look better in person, actually. Me too. Anyway, <laughs> um, you know, what I read in the paper, I, I'm, I don't have any inside knowledge on this one, but re what I read in the paper is that the Mueller's office referred that one to the Southern District of New York to look at, you know, some of Cohen's situation, and, and that's where the investigation is going. I mean, maybe Ross can connect it. I, I can't connect it any more than, you know, same guy is involved in both, I guess. So here, here's, the, here's the, the connection, I think. In these kinds of investigations, I think the I think I could say always there is always collateral damage. There are always collateral issues. Uh, you know, during the uh, during the Clinton impeachment process, it turned out that the, you know the Speaker of the House had to resign, and then his replacement had to leave. There is always collateral damage. It may turn out that Michael Cohen uh, is collateral damage uh, from this investigation. It could also be possible uh, that uh, one hand of the Department of Justice, namely the Southern District, uh, is doing something to try to help another hand of the Department of Justice, namely Mueller. We don't know, and maybe we won't. Maybe we will. All right, we have two minutes left, so I'm going to give you guys each one minute to make your closing argument, so to speak. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think should happen? What's your overall take? 60 seconds should be more enough to summarize the entire presidency. Ross, we'll, uh, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I could do it in about two seconds. I don't have any freaking idea what is going to happen here. Uh, Ross is absolutely right. <laughs> politics has gotten uh, so unpredictable. And in this context, even law enforcement has gotten, I think, so unpredictable. Who, who would have imagined a few years ago that you'd have an FBI director on a book tour, you know, talking about his investigations of the presidential candidates and his conversations, his, his, his confidential conversations 
with a president of the United States? So the answer is, I don't know. But what I hope is that in the end, Susan is not right that it all boils down to politics. And I know that, that that's a car- sort of a caricature of, of, of your initial point, Susan. But I hope all right. uh, that, that the rule of law actually does matter here um, and, and that this doesn't just evolve into a, a political shooting match. All right, Susan, last word is yours. I think it's a political shooting match. Um, I think it's sort of unfortunate, and, you know, I don't want to shoot at Trump one more time, but it's really unfortunate that so many of the, the basic principles around the rule of law have, have been up for grabs of late, and hopefully there will be a consensus about something. I, I'm not sure what it will be about, though. How's that? Okay. Well, there you have it. Thank you once again to my guests, Susan Estrich and Ross Garber. Thank you for your time. To all the audience members, uh, I hope you've enjoyed, and I hope you found this informative, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Distinguished Speaker webinar series. Take care, everybody. Thank you.